Hello and welcome back. In this best practices video, we're going to start with proper labeling of a form, then rules for content and rules for layout. We'll discuss inputs and submission, and finally how good design affects your completion rate. Every form should have a form title. The title should accurately describe the purpose of the form. Imagine that you were handed a tablet with a form showing on the screen. Would you be able to instantly describe the purpose of the form? Here's an example of a form with a title of payment. Does that describe the form? Well, sort of. How about this as a better title? Now we know we're about to spend money on a movie. And that does sound more fun. You should never use the word submit for a button that processes the form. Submit is a programmer's term that describes what the computer is doing with the form data. Most of our users simply don't care about the back end of a website. Instead, let's think about the end user by recognizing their wants and desires by completing our form. Say the phrase, I want to, and then complete the sentence. Whatever you add will become the name of the submit button. Let's try this out and see how it works. I want to submit. Now, doesn't that sound compelling? How about this? I want to purchase tickets. Now, that's a lot more focused on the person completing the form. Let's try another one that's even more personal and focuses on the end user. I want to purchase my tickets. Now there's also ownership tied in clicking the button. Remember that forms stand as a barrier between the user and what they want, so don't ask any questions that are not essential. In this example web form, the user wants to sign up for a community email message. Having an email to send the message is absolutely essential. You may also desire to personalize the monthly message with their name. However, everything else here is not required to send an email and should be removed. Asking for unnecessary information looks like data mining and that makes users uncomfortable. It also reflects on the professionalism, or black thereof, of your website. Our new form with all the unnecessary form parts removed looks like this. It's short, sweet, and has no unnecessary questions. Here's another example of a form that I recently found. This company is asking way too much information for a simple goal of joining a mailing list. What do you really need from the customer besides their name and email? I would argue that you don't even need to know what country I'm from, and that should be removed. This is what I would propose as a replacement. Which one would you rather fill out? If you want to collect relevant information that would be nice to have, but is not absolutely essential, then please clearly identify what is required and what is not. In this example, the customer is creating a profile. Many times people join a community with some hesitation. Later, if they like it, they may decide to complete their profile and add additional information. In this example, the full name, username, and password are all that's required to set up a profile. These others would help but can be added at a later time. Therefore, we need to clearly identify the required fields. Here, I have used a typical asterisk next to the required field. In this example, I've used a red border to identify the required fields. Which one do you think is the most clear? In this example, the designer chose to identify the required fields using a bold font weight, which also works. Labels should be placed above and left aligned with the related input. In this complaint form example, the labels are placed to the side. Here are all the places the user has to look for information to complete the form. An eye tracking pattern would look something like this. If we perform a little CSS surgery on this site, we have the labels in their correct position above and left aligned. Now the form is much easier to complete because the path is a straight line to the submit button, which by the way shouldn't be called submit. Forms should be in a single column. This helps the user quickly scan the form without having to jump around the web page. In this example, we have a form that has three different columns. It helps that the labels have been placed above and left aligned. However, the path to complete this form is still arduous. In this modification, I've placed everything in a single column with the labels still above and left aligned. 
As you can see, the eye tracking to complete this is a straight line from the top to the bottom and very easy to follow. I'm not sure why designers use more than one column. Perhaps as they develop for different size devices, they're trying to fill up the extra space. Really, it's okay to have empty space. Trying to fill up the screen by using multiple columns leads to poor form design, so don't do it. So please consider your customer first and build your form to accommodate their needs. When asking for a phone number, use a single input area. The format of phone numbers around the world is very different, so you need to allow for variation. Here are some of the many different conventions for writing phone numbers. As you can see, they vary in length, and within a country, mobile numbers can be different than landlines. So if you have a website and you want to gather information from anywhere in the world, this is not going to work. Instead, you need to have a single input that will accommodate any number length. If the user must select from many options, then use radio buttons, check boxes, or drop downs. Use radio buttons or check boxes for less than five choices and drop downs for more than five choices. In this web form example, the rule has been followed correctly. The attendee type is a list of five radio buttons. The country, which has more than five options, is a drop down. Let's look at a form where this rule has not been followed. Under entry status and gender, they have less than five options, so these should not be drop downs. Both of these should have been radio buttons. If there's a chance that the web user may not know exactly what's required, you may make a suggestion using placeholder text. Placeholder text should not be used as a replacement for labels. In this form, all I see is placeholder text. While this is pretty, it may lead to confusion because the instant I start typing, the placeholder text goes away. I no longer know exactly what I'm supposed to enter. Was I entering my email or my first name? They both start with the letter P. Now I could look down here and see that my name goes there, so perhaps I was entering my email. I could also delete what I had entered and see the placeholder text again. But either way, you've just slowed the user down and created confusion. That is exactly what we're not trying to do. If you have a series of radio buttons or checkboxes or items in a dropdown, you should order them logically. If there is a logical sequence like days of the week or meal times, then use that for ordering. If not, use ABC ordering, like this list of states, categories for a complaint, or options for a conference attendee. You should wrap all inputs in label tags. This helps when you have to touch small items like radio buttons or checkboxes. Having a label allows the user to click or touch the input or click or touch the label. Touching either place will activate that input if done correctly. As you can see, this would be really beneficial for radio buttons on a phone where you had to make a selection with your finger. Here is a last name input I found on a site that shall remain anonymous. This is the code. Notice that there is a label tag up here with a four equals and a long nasty looking name. Way down here we have an input with an ID and the same long nasty name. Now here is another last name input example. Notice in this example we have wrapped the input inside the label. This saves the need for for equals and ID equals. Which one would you rather code? Please do not ever use a reset button on your form page. The chance of someone accidentally pressing or touching it and erasing all their entries and then hating you forever is just too great. In this example, the clear form or reset button is actually bigger than the submit button that we want them to press. This makes the chance for error even greater. If someone really wanted to erase all their form entries, they could simply use the reload page on the browser. So let's be honest here. When was the last time you filled out a form and then decided you just wanted to start over? So why have a button that starts over for you? It just doesn't make any sense. When the form has been processed, show your web user a confirmation page so they know everything worked. It's good for morale. Here's an example of a contact form. 
When it's submitted, the page shows the information sent and informs the user of the next step. A form that you care enough about to make beautiful will inspire confidence in the person filling out the form. Here we have two forms asking for the exact same information. Which one would you rather share your credit card number with? Anything on a mobile device that needs to be touched, like a button or an input, should be a minimum of 44 pixels tall or wide. This first example is not touch ready at all. The inputs are only 18 pixels tall, which is less than half the recommended height. This second example is better, with three of the inputs being 35 pixels tall. However, these four selections are only 19 pixels tall and again will be a problem for fingers. In our example, we have inputs styled at 50 pixels tall. This form will generate a lot of love from your mobile users. You need to visually group related information so that the placement of the items suggests a relationship. In user credentials section of this form, you're not quite sure if the labels are referring to the item above the input or to the item below the input because the visual distance between the text and the input is exactly the same. In this improved example, we have visually grouped the labels and inputs, so there is no question. If you have a long form and you don't want to break it into multiple pages, you can at least chunk it into different areas using field sets. In this example, I have broken the form into four sections and the questions in each section are related to each other. Here you can see one of the four sections blown up. If we were to blur the form and look at it, we could still identify four sections even though the text is not legible. In this video, we talked about properly labeling a form, then the rules for content and layout. We then discussed inputs and submissions, and finally showed how good design affects your completion rate. Now we're ready to build a form.